Hi, my name is Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director of the Dresser Center for, for the Humanities, and not very good at AV stuff, as you can tell. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight's Humanities Forum event. This is our next to the last Humanities Forum of the semester, and our last one will be May 12th at 4 p.m., when Professor Thomas Field of Modern Languages and Linguistics, and also the Lippitz Professor of 2009-2010, will be giving our annual Lippitz Lecture with the topic of, if language may be dying, why are you studying it? And that'll be back here on the seventh floor. Our speaker tonight, Helene Cooper, was raised as the privileged child of the Liberian political aristocracy. Descendants of freed American blacks who founded Liberia in 1821. On the eve of the 1980 revolution in Liberia, just about everyone in the government was either a relative or connected in some way to her family. Her uncle was foreign minister, and she and her sisters, one biological and one quasi-adopted, watched on television the execution of her uncle and other relatives and family friends before her own immediate family fled after getting visas to the United States. Continuing her childhood with her adoptive sister left behind in Liberia, Elaine Cooper experienced racism for the first time after moving to the American South. She returned to Liberia for the first time 23 years later, a return she wrote about last April as the cover story in the New York Times Magazine. In the meantime, she has grown up to be one of this country's top journalists, going from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times, where she was the assistant editorial page editor then the diplomatic correspondent, and now is the White House correspondent. She is the journalist who often gets in the first question at President Obama's press conferences. She has won honors from various organizations, the, I'm not sure, it's not Mirage, but Mirage, is that how it's pronounced? Foundation for the American Dream and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'd like to quote from a review of her book by Steve Clemens of the Washington Post. And I quote, but the high drama of this story is not what moved me. What got me was how Helene Cooper, who is a top tier journalist in the United States, survived the assault on her life and basic identity, and then remade herself. I suspect we will be moved both by the high drama and by the amazing lives Helene Cooper has led and continues to live. As many of you know, Ms. Cooper was scheduled to speak here on March 24th, exactly four weeks ago, but was unable to leave her White House assignment at the last minute because there was a prospect of a breakthrough in negotiations over the situation in Jerusalem between President Obama and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. As she and I have just talked about, she wonders if she had come to UNBC if maybe things had gone better diplomatically. But anyway. As part of the Humanities Forum, and with support from the English Department and the Retriever Student Newspaper, she will be reading tonight from her memoir, The House at Sugar Beach, In Search of a Lost Childhood, and sharing stories about her past and how it has shaped her life and writing as a journalist. Please join me in welcoming Helene Cooper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was a great introduction. Um, and I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really sorry, first of all, about missing my date with you guys four weeks ago. Um, but I'm glad we were able to, to reschedule stuff. I was talking to, I sit next to, in the Times Bureau in Washington, um, I sit next to Scott Shane, who's from Baltimore. And he's sort of been my, my guide to, you know, when I needed to leave to get here on time and all of that. I was telling him, saying, talking about what I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight. And he was like, you know what, just forget about the book. Just, just you know, if you must, read a little bit out of the book, but then let them just ask you questions about Obama, because that's all they're going to want to talk about. I was like, no, you're going to have to hear about my book first. Um, and apparently a bunch of you here are, uh, I, I was asking Rebecca earlier, um, how did she get uh, students to come? And then I realized when I saw some of you going asking her to sign your, your sheet for your, your teachers that, that that's sort of the blackmail. And she's not going to sign them until we're done. So, 
Um, about eight years ago, nine years ago, um, on a very hot Friday, August afternoon, at the time I was still at the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Bureau, a few friends of mine and I busted out of the office early. This is kind of going in and out. We busted out of the office early and we um, decided to, can everybody hear me without this? Okay. Uh, and we decided that we were going to leave work and go across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge to get crabs and cold beer. It was one of those really hot days and we had the convertible down and we're playing Bruce Springsteen and we go we end up at this crab shack in Oxford, Maryland. And we're sitting on the water feeling very pleased with ourselves. And I said something about how, you know, actually my ancestors were from the Bay Area. And my friends looked at me, and they're both reporters, and they're like, what are you talking about? You're from Liberia. And I said to them, well, actually, yeah, but um, my family, I'm descended from the freed blacks who founded Liberia, and my ancestors are actually from this area. And I told them that evening about Elijah Johnson, my great, 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 great grandfather, who was on the first ship of freed blacks that went, left New York in 1820 for West Africa. I told them about, on my father's side, how there were four Cooper brothers who in 1829 left a ship in Norfolk uh, and headed to Liberia as well. I told them about how these freed blacks, might be better if I move away from the mic and just give up on it. Um, I told them about how these freed blacks were very courageous in that they founded a new country uh, which they built by themselves, but how ironically they set up the same kind of antebellum society that they had fled from in the American South, except this time, this time they, they weren't the slaves, they were the higher, the elites, and they took the, they, the native Liberians who were already there and looked down on them, because a lot of these people at the time weren't educated. I told them about how these people, these freed blacks and freed slaves, became the political elite of Liberia and how they forged this country, which was in many ways a beacon in West Africa for independence at the time when all of Africa was colonized by the Europeans. But how, at the, ironically, at this same time, these blacks were acting in very much the same way that the European col colonizers had been acting in other African countries. I told them about how I was born into this political dynasty and how I grew up sort of as a princess in Liberia, a land that was a country that was extremely poor, but we were very well off. And I told them about how this whole upside down political structure collapsed in 1980 when there was a military coup. The government was overthrown uh, by enlisted soldiers. My family was targeted uh, and attacked and I told them about how we ran away and I had spent the next 20 years sort of remaking myself into this American journalist. And when I'm done with my story, uh, they both looked at me and they're like, why haven't you written about this? And my response was the same response I always had whenever anybody asked me that question. I said, it's complicated, which is a very lame response. But that was all I had because I knew that I could never really write my own story until I first reconciled myself with the one thing that I hadn't told my friends about that night when we sat at that crab shack, and that was my sister Eunice, the sister that we had left behind when we ran away from home, and when I ran away from Liberia in 1980. When I was seven years old in 1973, my father built a big house on the Atlantic Ocean at Sugar Beach. He had 22 rooms and seven bedrooms. This was his like dream home. And for the first time, I had my own bedroom, which I was so excited about. But I quickly realized I was too afraid to sleep by myself, sleep alone at night. I was terrified. Liberia, in many ways, is very Americanized because it was founded by freed slaves. But I was imagining it's also very African. And I was terrified of heart men and witch doctors and who knows who were going to come and get me. So my parents did what was very common practice in Liberia at the time. They went out to the native Liberians, and they put out the word that their seven-year-old daughter needed a playmate. And Eunice's mother brought her 11-year-old daughter to live with us. And she would be raised sort of as my adopted or foster sister. We'd be raised as sisters. 
we would always know that sort of we were, you know, we were different, but she became from that point on my sister and my playmate. Um, we didn't get along at first at all. I was a complete spoiled princess brat. And I didn't like my turf being, you know, invaded by this foreigner. Who is this girl? And she didn't like being yanked out of her house and brought to live with, st with strangers, even though in Liberia this was common practice because the poor people often brought, and this is something that African women did in this sort of this staggering choice that they would make where they'd rather their kids be raised where they would be guaranteed three meals a day and a school to go to than keep them in their poor house. And so this was one of those choices that Eunice's mother made, a very difficult choice as you can imagine, but it's sort of the, sort of the circumstances that they were in. But Eunice didn't really like the idea of being yanked away from home and brought to live with this family. It took us a long time for us to sort of bridge kind of the suspicion on both sides. Uh, we eventually, it was fear that brought us together. We were both stuck in this big, huge monster of a house. And there were rogues, we called burglars rogues. And almost every night we would get broken into and they would steal my mom's ivory and we would curl up in the room and imagine that all these people were coming to get us and we were completely superstitious and all of that. And so eventually me and Eunice started dragging our mattresses down the, road, uh, down the hallway at night and we would sleep with my, in my younger sister's bedroom and all the kids started sleeping in there we sort of believed that if we all slept in the same bedroom we could protect each other when the Hartman came to get us um, it was in many ways an idyllic childhood not too unlike um, sort of an American childhood except it had its unique African uh, twist um, the first section I think I'm gonna read about is I'm mixing up I usually have my same my a usual routine but I think I'm gonna mix it up a little bit um, tonight uh, this is 1977. I was 11 years old. Life's big events took place at the Saturday afternoon matinees at Relda Cinema. It cost 75 cents to get in, plus 25 cents for popcorn with extra butter. There are always two movies, an American movie and a kung fu movie. Eunice and I wore short shorts and white go-go boots that Daddy bought us from America and strutted down the aisles, pretending that we were looking for somewhere to sit. Really, we were just scoping the place out to see who was there. The American movies were always raucous because Relda showed big action Hollywood blockbusters that proved how much white man can lie. The phrase, oh, white man can lie, oh, was well known in Liberia. It dated back to 1969 because no one in Liberia really believed that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. One giant step for mankind, said Neil Armstrong. Oh, white man can lie, oh, said Liberians. <laughs> that was the litany for us at Relda whenever we watched the American movies, especially the ones that showed robots and space travel. After the first American movie of the matinee, there was intermission, and the lights came on, and we could see who all were there. By the time the kung fu movies came on, everybody at Relda had regrouped to sit with different friends. One Saturday near Christmas time in 1977, a boy approached me at Relda to ask for my hand in girlfriendhood. His name was Lawrence Lincoln, and he was the native Liberian adopted son of a wealthy Congo family. I wasn't much interested in boys yet beyond my crush on Fidelis, our driver, but I wanted to seem cool, and Othello, my cousin, and Eunice both advised me to accept this rare proposal. So I gave, Eunice, I gave Lawrence what I thought was a husky yes, as instructed by Eunice and Othello. Let's give it a try, I said. That night back at Sugar Beach, Eunice and I sat on my bed, plotting for hours how I would leverage this new relationship to make the two of us more popular. <laughs> now that you have a boyfriend, other boys will come running, she said. You and mine will come all the way to Sugar Beach South. For three Saturdays straight, Lawrence and I went to Relda and set apart during the first movie of the afternoon, giggling with our cousins. Then, when the Kung Fu movies came on, I left Eunice and Othello and went and sat by myself, making sure there was an empty street next to me. Lawrence slipped into the empty seat and put his arm around the back of my chair. We never spoke, just sat there in the dark, watching Bruce Lee wreak havoc for the usual killing of his teacher by gangs in Hong Kong. Two weeks into our relationship came Christmas season. I didn't know what to get Lawrence for a Christmas gift. Othello, who also had a boyfriend, Ronnie Weeks, was way ahead of me. 
The Liberian radio airwaves were full of an ad for a cologne from America called Trouble. Sultry ad said, give your man trouble this Christmas. <laughs> a few days before Christmas, mommy took us Christmas shopping on Broad Street. I say, Eunice, I whispered as we walked into Evan's drugstore. Please help me sneak and buy Lauren some trouble. Yee, you crazy? So airlock can come cuss me? I beg you, yeah? Eh, you get, why be wicked? Ignoring me, Eunice went to the bath gel section and started playing with the bottles of body dos. With a surreptitious look at Mommy, I headed for the men's cologne section. Mommy spotted me immediately. Do not let Helene buy any men's cologne, she yelled at Helen Gibson, one of the clerks at Evans Drugstore. She's too young for that nonsense. Hey, ya namesake, you won't buy cologne for your boyfriend? <laughs> Helen Gibson said, pinching my cheek like I was some baby. Mommy trooped us over to the bookstore across the street and made me buy a copy of Huckleberry Finn for Lawrence. <laughs> I was mortified, but I, gave him the book at the, but I gave him the book the next day at Relda. Merry Christmas, I muttered. He gave me a dollar and a silver-plated ring. A fellow came walking up to us. We're standing at the side of the door of Relda. What Helen gave you for Christmas, she said, smirking. She gave me one book, Lawrence said. What you gave Ronnie? A fellow had clearly been practicing, waiting for this moment. I gave my man trouble this Christmas, <laughs> she breathed. Sultrily. The next Saturday, we were watching Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon, sitting next to each other at Relda, when suddenly Lawrence leaned over and kissed me on the corner of my mouth. It was wet. I jumped out of my chair and bolted to the girls' bathroom. I stayed in there for about 15 minutes before going back to Lawrence and breaking up with him. I don't think it's working out, I said. He looked at me. I hear you've been going around telling people you were going to break up with me, he said. No, I haven't. I denied, even though that's exactly what I had been doing. A few days before, Nimali, a schoolmate, had asked me if Lawrence was my boyfriend. Acting on Eunice's instructions for leveraging our newfound popularity, I told Nimali yes, but added, not for long. I was trying to make myself seem like a player. I should have known that Nimali would spread it around, and now Lawrence had heard, and his feelings were hurt, confronted. I lied. I said nothing like that. Nimali is a big, fat liar. Now I'd impugn Nimali's honor, and she and her friends had already beaten me up once before, two years ago. In the days that followed, the accusations flew. The next Saturday at Relda was clearly going to be a showdown between Nimali and me, and her friends. The last time they had beaten me up was at least in the privacy of the girls' bathroom at ACS. Now this would be in front of all of Monrovia society at Relda. Eunice, what would do? I wailed to Eunice the Friday night before the big fight day. I was shuffling around the TV lounge while Eunice watched Mission Impossible. I loved that show, but this was no time to be thinking about exploding tape recorders. My butt was about to get beat in public. But what made you go lie so? I don't know. Eunice looked at me. I was puny. They would be you for truth. Eunice took me outside to the ocean side of the house to teach me how to fight. The waves from the ocean were pounding the shore so loud we had to shout to hear each other. The lesson was coming a little late, since the showdown was scheduled for the next day, but I was desperate. Okay, yeah, what you want to do if she kick you, Eunice said, kicking me in the stomach. <laughs> Ow! I toppled over backwards into the grass. But you get you lazy, oh. Why you kick people like that for? How you learn how to fight if people can't kick you? <laughs> I got up, wiping the back of my jean shorts, where wet grass clung to my backside and scratched my leg. Mosquito not bite me. I knew I was acting like a sport princess who deserved to get her butt beat. Tears were starting to rise. Eunice, what would do? She was shaking her head, completely disgusted. The girl ain't touched you yet, you already crying? Turning, she walked around to the front and went inside the house, and I walked behind her. As we crept down the hallway toward the bedrooms, the house was still except for the rattle of the various air conditioning window units. Daddy's central air conditioning had long conked out. Eunice quietly opened the door of Marlene's bedroom and we crept in, sliding onto our respective mattresses on the floor. The silence extended for 10 minutes. I could hear Marlene's deep breathing. She was fast asleep. I couldn't hear anything from Eunice, though, which meant she was awake. Eunice, I whispered. Oh, stop whining. You think I would let anybody be you? Her stutter was back. She was fed up with me. The next day, we went to Relda at 2 p.m., as usual. My heart was in my mouth. I knew our fight was unofficially scheduled for after the show. That's when all fights happened. 
It would be in the parking lot in front of Brelda, just as the parents and drivers were picking up their kids. That's where everybody congregated to draw out the long goodbyes before going home. I trailed out of the cinema after the show, clenching and unclenching my fists. The group was assembled outside, waiting for me. I saw Lauren sitting on the fence, slightly apart, watching the whole thing. Nimali, flanked by her awful friends, stood to one side. In front of them was an empty space where I was supposed to be. I hovered in the doorway. Come on, Helen Koopa, somebody yelled. And then I saw them. Surrounding my side of the fight space was Eunice, Vicky, Othello, Siru, Michelle, even Marlene. They were clapping for me. They were all primed and ready to jump in. I had backup. <laughs> I swaggered over to Numali, hands on my hips. I paused dramatically, waiting for the place to quiet down. And then I spat out. What is lying going to get you, Numali? Silver and gold? I never gave her a chance to open her mouth. All the strength of my sisters and cousins were flowing through me. The blood I got from my grandmother pounded through my veins. I cussed her out. Then, flanked by my sisters and cousins, I flounced away into the waiting Mercedes Benz with Fidelis at the wheel. We peeled off in a righteous cloud of dust. It was a Merry Christmas after all. <laughs> God, when I go back and think about that time, I just realize just how horrible I was. Um, writing this book was enormously difficult for me because there's so much part of how you know a lot of people in my family have dealt with trauma was to just shut it down and move on and I sort of acquired that habit as well um, so going back and trying to revisit um, really painful parts of my life was difficult I was really happy to, vi to visit happy times in my life like you know growing up and boys and going to the beach and hanging out with my sisters and my friends but a lot of the other stuff was incredibly incredibly hard um, it's almost as if you have a scab or wound that heals and then you go and you pick at it and it starts bleeding again and that's what I sort of often felt like when I was going back to some of the harder things like going back to the day when the soldiers came to our house and my mother sacrificed herself for me and my sisters or going back to the day that my uncle Cecil was executed on the beach or going back to the day that my dad died. When the military coup happened in Liberia overturning the government and 150 years of rule by the Congo elite it really upended my world. After my mother was raped my father was shot and my cousin executed on the beach, we ran away to Knoxville, Tennessee, where we had cousins. We left Eunice behind. Um, my mom asked her to come with us, and she at the time was a senior in high school, and she said she didn't want to leave her mother, who she still saw regularly. Mrs. Bull used to come to our house to see Eunice, and we used to take Eunice to see her mom. She also wanted to stay and graduate with her class. And I think at the time that we left, I sort of felt, I thought in my head, she's going to come and join us. She's going to come and join us after she graduates. We'll figure out a way. I was 14 years old at the time, you didn't, and it was inconceivable to me that this was it. Uh, you know, this, she had been my sister at this point for seven years. Um, it was completely inconceivable to me that I wouldn't see her again. Um, we ended up in Knoxville. I was in the 10th grade. In the space of three months, I went from being the popular girl at my private school in Liberia to the suspicious new refugee from Africa at my public school in Knoxville, Tennessee, where nobody had ever even heard of Liberia, something I was completely outraged by. I had heard about it, the United States. How could they not have heard of Liberia, I thought. Uh, I didn't have any friends, and I used to hide in the library uh, at lunch uh, because I didn't have anybody to eat lunch with. This is 1980. From my perch in the corner of the Holston High School Library, I either worked on my romance novel or continued my letters to Eunice. My letters were as imaginative as the Harlequin romance I was working on, glowingly describing my new life and my make-believe friends. I painted a story of a, life that, a, of a life that echoed the American dream as we had imagined it to be from Liberia. My imaginary relationship with Junior Lowey progressed to his escorting me to homecoming. Junior was on the basketball team and I had made the cheerleading squad. 
He was always taking me out for ice cream after practice. We had started making out, but he had only gotten to second base so far. I was always turning down dates from other guys who found me exotic. I was trying to stay faithful to Junior, but it was so hard because so many of the boys at Holston were chasing after me. In the real world, Junior was on the basketball team. He was in my geometry class, and he had smiled at me once. Each week, I left my letters on the dining room table, and Mommy mailed them during the day. Eunice could read me like the cheap novels we both loved. Eh, hey, Helen, you know you're not no cheerleader, she wrote back. <laughs> Eunice's letters were written in red ink. She was sleeping at night with a wet towel on her chest because her mother's house had no air conditioning. After six years of living with the Coopers, Eunice was back to being Basil, living again with her mother and five other cousins and adopted kids in her mother's small house in Sincor. How do you re-become what you were six years before? Can you erase six years? Mrs. Bull tiptoed around Eunice like she was a fragile flower. Her daughter was used to the best after living with the Coopers. Mrs. Bull felt that she was under pressure to keep Eunice in the style she believed she had become accustomed to. She put aside the plumpest and juiciest crawfish from the cassava leaf in the afternoon for Eunice because, she told the brood of stray children who hung around the house looking for handouts, there was now a VIP living there, Mrs. Cooper's daughter. She called Eunice Mrs. Cooper's daughter. Eunice's mother told the other kids in the house to make sure they left the good rice for Mrs. Cooper's daughter. She spent her scarce money on shampoo and conditioner because, she told one and all, Mrs. Cooper's daughter was used to using real shampoo, not the rough caustic soda soap that many Liberians used to wash. Being in Knoxville for me felt like straddling two worlds. There was my physical world, with the monotony of going to school every day where no one talked to me, and coming home to watch General Hospital with Marlene, and occasionally trips, occasional trips to Sizzlin's Steakhouse with Mommy. At night, Daddy called from North Carolina with updates about his new job as an accountant with a company in Durham. We could never talk long on the phone, though, because it was long distance and cost 10 cents a minute unless you called after 11 p.m. When we lived at Sugar Beach, if we wanted to talk to someone, we went to their house. Then there was the world in my head, the one in Liberia, pre-April 12, 1980. That was the world I cared about, the world that I missed so much. That was the world filled with beautiful, ripe smells of dried fish and tropical flowers. The world was filled with people I knew and people who knew me. It was filled with the deep to the bone knowledge that I was somebody and I came from somewhere. A world that Elijah Johnson and Randolph Cooper and my ancestors had built from scratch through blood and sweat. I started very early on in Tennessee and then when we moved the next year to North Carolina focusing on the TV news. I used to love watching ABC World News Tonight because Britt Hume from the State Department would stand in front of the State Department and there would be all these flags behind him and I could imagine, I would imagine I could see the Liberian flag and I felt like it connected even though nobody around me I thought at my school knew about Liberia, there was somebody out there that did as well. That sort of started my deep interest and abiding interest in news. It felt to me as if the journalists, and at the time it was the Iran hostage crisis, there was all this stuff going on, and it felt to me like the journalists were out there in the world. And the idea of being out there in the world to me felt as if I would be closer to Liberia. If I was not landlocked in Knoxville, Tennessee, if I was traveling, I would be somehow closer to, to home. It's a really weird, you know, psychological. I, I'm sure some psychiatrists could have a field day with me. I also read All the President's Men my junior year, and at that point I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And it was partly because I think when the coup happened in Liberia, I'd been so naive about all this political turmoil and all this, this, this class different and all this churning and all this injustice and all this stuff that had been going on around me where I lived and I completely was, un I was not clued in. I was too busy doing my own thing and living in my little you know, preteen, tween world. And so I was completely shocked when the military overthrew the government. And I think I, gra I gravitated toward journalism then because I never wanted to be surprised again. I wanted to know the whys behind why people did things. I wanted to be aware of things as they were happening around me. And I think that all played a big part, a big part in it. Um, I also realized that I could make friends if I acted more American. 
um, at your, you know, it was my junior and senior year. Now we're in North Carolina living with our dad. Um, and all I cared about was, you know, I still didn't have any friends. And if I acted less Liberian, I polished up my American accent and I started to shed my Liberian skin more and more. And I eventually assimilated with the rest of my high school uh, classmates. And when I went on to college at the University of North Carolina, in the meantime, Liberia was going through what feels like the ninth circle of hell from, you know, eventually Charles Taylor invaded, overthrew, uh, Doe was killed, uh, President Doe, who had taken over in 1980, um, and it launching this uh, civil war that, you know, there were child soldiers, there were so many people killed, there were these horrific, horrific images coming across the television screen about my country. And I started to believe that everybody in Liberia, like, that Liberia wasn't a place that you lived. It was a place where you died. Um, and in my mind, I thought that if I cut off all of the close people, who were people, my friends and family in Liberia, who were close to me, then it wouldn't help. It wouldn't hurt me when they died. And I was convinced that they were they were going to die, and a lot of them did. Um, I burrowed myself into becoming a reporter. I joined first the Providence Journal and then the Wall Street Journal. Eventually ending up at the New York Times, and I traveled all over the world writing about foreign policy and all these different crises. I was in Cambodia, I was in Haiti. I went everywhere except Liberia. Um, and I threw myself into this and sort of remade myself into this American journalist while at the same time killing off the part of me that was Liberian. You can imagine uh, that's not a very healthy way to behave. Eunice and I had been writing to each other for years, but they eventually trickled out because it was very hard to get mail to Liberia. The mail service stopped, and if you wanted to write a letter to somebody in Liberia, you had to find somebody who was going them, physically give it, going there and give them the letter. And we eventually fell out of touch somewhere in the 90s as Liberia was going through one civil war after another, and you're seeing this stuff. Um, uh, All of this sort of literally came crashing down on me eventually, as you can imagine, because this is not emotionally or psychologically a kind of healthy way to go about your life. Um, so the last two parts, I'm going to just finish up with two quick sections and then um, open it up for questions. But I've been traveling around all over the place. Um, I had just come back from, I was working at the uh, the Wall Street Journal at the time, I just come back from Kuwait, uh, and Kuwait inevitably led me to, you can imagine, Iraq. It was 2003. While Liberia was convulsing one more time into the death throes of one more war with a new rebel group called LURD, or Liberians United for Reconciliation and Development, gunning for Charles Taylor and heading and bearing down on Monrovia, I was at military boot camp preparing to embed with the U.S. Army who were going in to liberate the besieged population of Iraq. While Liberians were crawling on their hands and knees on the floors of what was left of their homes to get away from rockets and grenades, I was hanging out with the 500-strong press corps at the Swank Kuwait Hilton Resort, getting anthrax vaccinations and going through training se se sessions on how to use my gas mask. Who are you going to put me with? I demanded for the hundredth time of Major Mike Birmingham, the press liaison for the Army's 3rd Infantry Division. I better get a good unit, you hear me? I better be up front. The luxurious Kuwait Hilton was not a bad place to wait for President Bush to start his war. During the day, I ch shopped with my colleagues for desert war sundries that we forgot to get when we were in the States. Lip balm, canteens, extra batteries for our Thuraya satellite phones. I really wanted some night vision goggles, but they cost $1,800 the same as the expensive French-made flak jacket recently purchased for me by the Wall Street Journal, and I knew there was no way that the journal bean counters would turn a blind eye to the additional expense. Wall Street Journal reporters Michael Phillips, Nick Kulish, and Yaroslav Trofimov, Trofimov were in Kuwait with me, and the four of us were our own brand of brothers and sister in arms. We commandeered Mohammed, a hip, cool, Beatles-loving Lebanese taxi driver who traveled with $5,000 getaway cash in his socks. Mohammed took us to the mall during the day and to the pool hall of the go-kart tracks at night. He took us to Kuwait City, 
It's Kuwait City's only outdoor gear store, where a tailor measured us for khaki multi-pocketed vests and cool cargo pants. I only want pockets around my knees, I ordered, for the, I ordered the tailor, standing with my arms outstretched as he measured my surprisingly shrinking waist. No pockets around my hips, they'll make my butt look fat. We were all four rapidly losing weight in the time we had been waiting around for the war to start because there was no alcohol to be had in Kuwait City, at least none that we could find. We had long finished the scotch that a friendly Marine had smuggled in for me in a Listerine bottle. Minty scotch actually tastes best if you use 7-Up as a mixer. <laughs> Every night we hung out with the other reporters and bemoaned the lack of liquor. One night a group of CNN reporters spread the word that they had smuggled in a case of wine and we all rushed to their chalet at the Hilton. It turned out to be altar wine. We drank it anyway. When we weren't out shopping, we spent our time searching for a Thuraya satellite. The journal had issued us both the Raya and Iridium sat phones, along with laptop computers that would allow us to file our war stories from the desert. But the Thurias and Iridiums were both finicky in completely different ways. The Thuraya could hold a signal for days on end, and you could hear someone 10,000 miles away as clear as if they were right next to you. But first, you actually had to find and lock onto a Thuraya signal, which we discovered we could only do from the rooftop of the Marriott Hotel in downtown Kuwait City. We are so screwed, I said, after Michael and I blew our entire day on the Marriott roof trying uselessly to lock into a satellite. What's the point of getting ourselves practically killed in a war if we can't call home and say we're getting killed? <laughs> on other days, we watch war movie DVDs on our laptops, The Dirty Dozen, Three Kings. As the days spread to weeks and then a month, I found myself actually praying for the war to hurry up and start. Screw the UN, I muttered at another alcohol-free journalist party. I can't take this waiting anymore. The next day, Muhammad took us back to the mall. He had to drive at exactly 64 miles an hour because all cars in Kuwait are wired so that when the driver hits 65, an annoying beep beep sounds to alert you that you are driving too fast. We listened to the radio and Nick started chatting to Muhammad about music. I stared at the wind, out the window at Kuwait City as we passed the Fuddruckers restaurant. I heard a familiar intro the beginning of Michael Jackson's song, Liberian Girl, from his 1987 LP, Bad. A woman whispered seductively in Swahili, since Michael Jackson apparently didn't bother to find out that we don't speak Swahili in Liberia. <laughs> the gloved one started to croon, Liberian girl, you came and you changed my world. Just, you see, I can't really sing. <laughs> Nick, laughing, asked Muhammad to crank up the volume. Oh, give me a break, I protested. But Muhammad and Nick were both laughing now and singing, so I gave up and joined in with them. We howled, I love you, Liberian girl. Of course, I was now the least Liberian girl a Liberian girl could be. I hadn't stepped foot in Liberia in years. I was now an American citizen. I still spoke Liberian English to my family, but my color was now impeccable, and I dreamt in American the only way someone I met for the first time had any clue I was from Liberia was if they happened to ask me where I grew up or overheard me talking to my family. Otherwise, I was just a nondescript black chick with an accent that could be from Chicago or New York or Philadelphia. I lived the American dream with my bungalow outside Washington, D.C. and my convertible and my trips to Bruce Springsteen concerts. When an immigration officer in Honolulu told me welcome home as I transited through on my way back to mainland U.S. from Singapore, I burst into tears and thanked him profusely. When September 11 happened, I was outraged and teary at the attack on my country. I knew, even as we frittered away the days awaiting word on the invasion, that Liberia had descended into the ninth circle of hell, where 10-year-olds were taken from their parents and forced to fight in the country's never-ending civil war. But my concern at this moment was whither America. The great United States of America was invading Iraq and I was there to record it for posterity as a war reporter. It didn't take long after the war started for me to get in trouble. Uh, a few weeks later, outside of Nazaria, Iraq, it was dark and we were traveling black without headlights so the Iraqis couldn't see us. Everyone put on night vision goggles which made it much easier to see, although they gave the air greenish cast I'd never before seen up close the bo actual bombing of a town, and the sight had my heart pounding. An explosion in the distance coated, created a huge fireball. Who did that? I yelled at Chaplain Trogdon. Us or them? 
We're doing it to them, he said. Nearby, U.S. soldiers lobbed a torrent of 155 millimeter shells at Iraqi troops about nine miles away. There was frantic chatter over their radio. Do not stop, do not stop, the convoy must keep moving. The message was clear. If the convoy stopped while bombing Iraqi positions, it would become a line of sitting ducks. Then the convoy stopped. For about 15 minutes, we just sat in line in the sand. In the Humvee, no one talked. On the radio, the screaming chatter continued. You must keep moving. Finally, we started moving again. A series of seven deafening sonic-like booms went off just to the left. At the wheel, Specialist Miller started cheering. The MLRSs, he yelled, clapping his hands. We had just used multiple launch rocket systems to fire 12 rockets containing cluster bombs on the Iraqis. As they landed, fireball after fireball exploded. I tried to drown out Specialist Miller's cheering and the sound of the shelling. My palms were sweating. I was getting overwrought. What must it feel like to be on the receiving end of all of this TNT? No sooner did that thought enter my head than our Humvee burst open in a thunder, thundering, violent crash. We were hit. My first thought was no thought, it was pain. A sudden searing explosive pain in my back, so intense I knew I was mortally hurt. My head was crushed into my spine, I couldn't breathe. There was yelling outside, it took me several moments to realize that I was the only one in what was left of the Humvee. Somehow both the chaplain and Specialist Miller were gone. I had been sitting in the back seat, but now my head was pinned to the steering wheel. There was a crushing weight on my back. Outside, shouting, get her out of there! The only part of my body I could move were my fingers, which were pinned against my trousers. I felt a warm liquid oozing through my chem suit. Then someone was reaching into the Humvee to touch me. Then another yell. Medivac! Medivac! She's bleeding out! She's bleeding out! I can't move! I yelled. I was slowly realizing I wasn't dead yet. We hadn't been hit by an Iraqi bomb. A tank, one of ours, had run over my Humvee, crushing the vehicle and pinning me to the wheel. Chaplain Trogdon and Specialist Miller, in the front seats, both got pushed out either side of the Humvee as it crumpled. I was not so lucky. Or was I? After what seemed like hours, but were more like just five minutes or so, somebody figured out that since the tank hadn't been so much as scratch, they could just back it up from on top of me. They pulled me out of the now crushed Humvee and spread me on my back in the sand. Someone began to examine me. And in that moment, as I lay in the sand in the desert, my chem suit soaked with what turned out to be oil, not blood. I thought of Liberia. I shouldn't die here, I thought. What a stupid place to die. What a stupid war to die in. If I'm gonna die in a war, it should be in my own country. I should die in a war in Liberia. I went home after that uh, to look for my sister and to sort of begin to reconcile myself with uh, my past, with my childhood, with what I had become, and with my own family's role in what had happened to Liberia. Um, and I guess this book is the rest of the story that I didn't tell my two friends that day. We went over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge to get crabs and cold beer. Um, that's my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have, including any ones you might want to ask about covering President Obama. <laughs> It's, um, I go back home now pretty much every year, year and a half, and it's still very intense when I go back. Uh, Liberia is still in incredibly bad shape. It's gotten a lot better. We have the first female ever elected president of um, an African country in Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. The country has been war free for almost seven years now, which is huge for us. And there's a lot of reconstruction going on. It's still 
incredibly, incredibly poor. And it's still post-war. The population is so traumatized. Everybody you talk, every single person in Liberia that you bump into is a survivor, has been through hell and back. And you can see that in the faces of the women and the children and like so many of the Liberians. And yet they have this incredible reservoir of strength that I actually get a lot of strength from. That said, I don't want to go back and live there. It's a really selfish thing to say, but I, it's, I, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine myself leaving you know, the life that I have now and going back and living in Liberia. It's, I, it's too much, I think too much time has passed for me and there's a lot of water under the proverbial, proverbial bridge. I don't ever want to cut off Liberia the way I did for 23 years. I can't survive whole, you know, if I don't have it to go back to whenever I want to, but I, at this stage, can't see myself living there. Yes? Do you think needs to be done that could involve uh, diplomacy from our country as well as from other nations to change that? Uh, it, it seems that you have a feeling that maybe it's already sunk too far. Uh, and I'm a person who believes that maybe something could be done if there were a cooperative kind of arrangement that could be worked out. So let's be the, the good fairy and and what would you, if you had the power and the money and the people, what do you think could be done? Uh, first of all, I don't think Liberia has sunk too far at all. I think Liberia is one of the most hopeful places you can go to because what these people have been through and the fact that they still have their ridiculous sense of humor and the joy of life that is still there, even in the midst of the worst parts, even during the war, in the midst of the worst parts of the war, you didn't, Liberians didn't lose their completely inappropriate sense of humor and you still get that. And the music and the vibrancy of the culture is very much there. The food is unbelievable. It's just so in your face. You feel like you're in the middle, you're in the center of the action when you're there and there's you know, there's incredible poverty, but at the same time, these are people who, particularly the women, who have been through hell and they've strapped their babies on their back and they've kept going. And these market women who were raped and bludgeoned and left to die and left to, pregnant by their rapists in the forest to have the kids that their rapists and pregnant in it, and they had these babies and they put these babies on their back and they went back and they sat back on the side of the road with their oranges and they're selling on the side of the road and they're driving that economy. That's not a place at all that has sunk too far. So I definitely don't think the country is, I think the country has enormous pot potential. A lot of that potential, you know, hasn't been realized, but I don't think like for Liberia to come back, I don't think it's something I don't, as a Lib and I'm going to speak now as a Liberian, it's not for the United States to do for us, it's for us to do for ourselves. Uh, what I think Liberians would love from the United States is more aid and more foreign aid and more people and more capital and all of that. But I think the, the decision has to be made and I think it's being made within Liberia itself. I think the election of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in 2005 was huge and this showed you know, this was done by the women there. And the women there are, I know I keep harping on this, but these, they are very, they are incredible. You know, many ways they're the ones, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen this documentary, Pray, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, about how these women organized during the last months of the Civil War to just stop and force these guys to get to the peace table and negotiate and push them to negotiate on Charles Taylor's finally eventual, you know, banishing from the country. But I think this is, I think it's, it's much more in our hands as Liberians than it is for the outside world. Yes. Brigitte Fessenden. Um, I was wondering, did, did your family or did you overhear them ever talk about this history between America and the colonization and what it did in the beginning and the development of this? Absolutely. I we mean, talked about. 2014 when you came, but mm -hmm. when you yeah, we talked about growing up. I was, you know, my parents, my mom always told, told me about Elijah Johnson uh, and getting on that first boat. I didn't really believe he existed until, until I started working on my book and I found his journal 
through some offshoot of the Library of Congress. It was the journal that he kept when he was on the ship, the Elizabeth, that sailed from New York to West Africa in 1820. And that just blew my mind to see his handwriting and all of that. But now you're asking me, I sense that what you're actually asking me is, did rich people sit around and talk about why they were rich? And that's something that if you go all over the world, people don't exactly you know, sit and it's very much, is very, they certainly talked about politics and they talked about you know, the rice riots and they talked about you know, the poverty in Liberia, but you know, do, I don't know, do rich Americans sit around and say, you know, how did we get here? Right, but not so much that, but I, I just wonder, I mean, this is sort of basic, did, did people think it was a good historic idea to, as you know, this whole idea is- The Back to Africa it was movement. A good thing or a bad thing. We were in like, at the time, and see, you, you gotta separate into, you know, the before, it's e let me stop. It's easy with the benefit of hindsight to look back and say, oh my God. At the time that I was growing up in Liberia, we thought that Liberia was like the bomb. We would look around and there were all these coups going on in all these other African countries and we'd say, look, it's not happening here. You know, we were never colonized by Europeans. You know, we are so, you know, we're so great. Look at how, you know, we're the, it's ruled by black people and blah, 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 and we got our stuff together and yada, yada, yada. And we didn't sit around and look at the iron. I certainly didn't, I was 14, but look at the irony of the fact that we were acting like the Europeans and all the other African countries. So, you know, I can see that now, but if you're asking whether I, you know, saw that before as a child, no, I didn't. Um, my parents uh, certainly discussed it, not, not that much with me. They certainly discussed it with me a lot more after after the coup, and I remember my dad used to get into these big, huge political arguments with people all the time. And there was definitely the feeling, even within the elite class in Liberia, that you needed to change, that this was this whole, this two-tier system was ridiculous, and there were some people pushing for change quickly, and some people saying, no, you gotta do it slower, and that was, you know, and that wasn't fast enough for most of the rest of the population with good reason. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm from Liberia, and, and I've seen your magazine. I keep track of how you're doing. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've been here before the coup. I was there when government died. I was there when police officer died. I was there when Joe died. I was there when Charles Taylor was arrested. Have you and been home? I haven't been home. The last time I was home was 82. Wow. So uh, I um, own my own business. A true friend, they heard about you and they told me they should come. My question to you, being that you went to school in the South, you're a journalist, what's your observation regarding African American in this country? knowledge they know about Liberia, even though your ancestors left here and went to Liberia. But my knowledge is that very little, if anything, an African American would go to Ghana or Tanzania first before they think about going to Liberia. And my question to you to share with these folks is, why is that? Is there any reason based on your experience, your journalism, what have you observed? I would like to share with these people because the reason I asked this about a month ago, in my church we have an international organization and I did a presentation paper on Liberia. And at the end of my presentation, I left the question with them. African-American church. Can you live here in this room? I said, think about why is it that you have all these great men that left here, sacrifice their life to go to Liberia, to settle in Liberia. Why haven't you fall off to forgotten about it? It was very emotional at the end of my presentation. So, I would like your take to see who 
would you have seen to share with this girl? Um, nobody's ever asked me that. Um, thank you, sir. And I think you actually you need to go home for a visit. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to your question. My guess would be that black Americans identify, we're all descended from slavery. And that's where the first black American identification with Africa is going to come from, which is why black Americans who are interested in Africa are going to go to Ghana, because that's where their ancestors, that's not the only place. But they're thinking they're going to be, uh, they're going to more quickly identify with the fact that my ancestors were taken as slaves from West Africa, from Central Africa, passed through the Congo River, and ended up on these sh slave ships and ended up here in the United States. So if, you, if you're a black American and you want to reconnect with Africa, that's the first place you're going to think. You're going to think, I want to reconnect with where the people I descended from came from. Not necessarily with what these guys who brought over here as slaves with me decided to go and do, which is they decided to go back to Liberia. That's, their, that's, that's a complete split. You know, so that's not, I don't think there's a natural, an immediate natural bond or affinity that there will be because if you're, you're looking at that and if I'm looking into my own history and what, you know, the first place I'm going to start off is where the people I'm descended from came from, not some choices that people who I had nothing to do with, you know, made to go back to Liberia. Um, I think, I don't think the, the lack of knowledge about Liberia is limited to blacks by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think all around the world, everywhere I go, Liberia just doesn't really register, you know. It's a small country, it's not God, and it's, it's, more, it's most sad for me in the United States because Liberia is founded by the, a, an experiment in the United States and it's so wrapped up in American history. And Liberians, above all else, love the United States. There is nowhere else you can go, I mean, no matter what is going on in this world, you know, you go to Liberia and they will like lie down for you. There's this like they idolize America and the fact that America doesn't really pay that much attention to Liberia is has always been kind of sad to me. I just want to add to this. Um, there is a sister city, a sister state relationship between Baltimore and Maryland as a state between Kabarna, I hope I say that right. Banga. 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 And so the effort to do cultural and other exchange between the two cities are fostered through that. Yes. You know about it? Uh, yeah. It's all of the above. It's very much shared culture. You still, we still use the American dollar. I mean, there's Liberian currency too, but it's virtually not really worth much. And so we, we have the cop, for instance, the police officers growing up wore New York City police officer uniforms. Our flag looks like the American flag, except it has one star. You know, our capital is named after President James Monroe. It's very much, and we were founded by American slaves. So it was America, we were really colonized by America. That's its history to start with. And then it goes on to, you know, to everything else. And of course, it plays with American culture as well. Very much. When you look at our food, a lot of Liberian food, the reason why Liberian food rocks is because it incorporates the best of West African cooking with the best of Southern, like, gumbo, okra infused type stuff. And it is, the best food you're going to have anywhere. I'm going to stop talking about it because I'll get hungry again. <laughs> so I just wrote, um, I just wrote um, a column for the New York Times travel section on eating my way around Monrovia on my last trip home in um, October. So I'm waiting for, the, for them to run it. It'll be my first big Liberian restaurant. The reviews of all the hot restaurant spots in Monrovia. <laughs> yes. You want me to give away my whole book? <laughs> There's a reason I stopped on page 308. <laughs> um, you know, if, is anybody planning on reading the book? Am I going to ruin it for them or whatever? It's sort of. We want to know the in between part. Huh? We want to know the in between part. Okay. Um, I, I, I found Eunice. Um, she's awesome. She is she's sort of inexplicably 
and to this day, I don't know how I lucked out so much, welcomed me back. Um, it was an incredible experience because I didn't know at the time I decided to go home whether she was alive or dead. I knew that a few years ago she had worked for Firestone, but this was before the latest war had started. And so when I came <laughs> back here from Iraq, I called Bridgestone Firestone in Nashville and they gave me the phone number of the, they still called it a plantation, the Firestone Plantation in, um, uh, in uh, Harbell. And I called the plantation manager, and I still remember I was on Route 1 uh, when I left my cell phone with the woman that answered. And I was on the Route 1 pulling out a Target in Alexandria when my phone rang, and it was the plantation manager, and I said, um, I'm looking for Eunice Bull, who used to work for you. And he said, Eunice isn't here right now. And I like started sobbing, because he said, isn't here right now. And that was, I mean, after not knowing if she was alive or dead for at that point, like 12 years, it was sort of a confirmation. We couldn't really hear, because he was on a sat phone, and you know, because of the war was still going on at the time. And I just screamed at him, you know, tell her her sister's coming home. <laughs> And I went home, and I got there, and I rented a car, and I went <coughs> up to um, Firestone. Uh, it's an hour outside of uh, Monrovia, and we went to, I went to the labor office, which is where she worked. And he had told her, this was like two weeks later that I finally got there, and when I entered the office, it was this office with about 20 women inside. And I didn't see her at first. I'm standing at the door. And I just heard these voices, these people starting to talk in the room. And they started saying, Eunice, your sister here. It's like, hey, I love Eunice's sister. It was like, Eunice, your sister here. And then I saw her across the room. And she was standing there. And she, she just, the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, she's still wearing the same glasses. But she had these same <laughs> glasses. And then you know, she's hugging me. And I'm bawling. And she kept saying, we're not going to do that here. We're not going to cry. We're not going to cry. And then she took my hand, and she turned to the entire room like she was making this formal presentation. And she said, this is my sister. And it was like an incredibly intense moment for me. Um, we hung out for three weeks while I was there. Uh, we talked a lot. I was very, um, I, was, I really wanted to know if she hated us for leaving her. And it turned it out, you know, of course she said she didn't. Um, she'd gotten, just gotten married, um, and she had uh, recently, after I left Liberia, um, she had a daughter. And it was funny because she was on the way, she came to visit for the first time in 2008. Uh, we had tried for years to get her a visa, and they kept getting, the American Embassy kept turning her down because they were convinced that she was, you know, they got to keep immigrants out or whatever. And finally, uh, she got the visa in 2008, and she came here to visit. And I got her, this is a funny story. I got, for some reason that I can't even, Laura Bush liked the book. And uh, <laughs> it went around the White House, and we were invited to the White House for a private Oval Office session with George Bush. And so we went to the Oval Office, me, Eunice, and my sister, Marlene. Um, and uh, we met with Bush in the Oval Office for 15 minutes, and you just got a picture, a photo taken with Bush. Uh, she called me a couple of days ago to say she's coming back, because my sister Marlene is about to have a baby, and you just wants to come to be here for the baby. And I was like, you didn't even call me, because before, you know, she would say, I want to try to go to the embassy and try to get another visa. And I was like, I'd write all these letters, and they would say no or whatever, and it's always really hard. I was like, how come you didn't even call me to get, you know, to start the ball ro rolling, to write the letter, you know, and all that for your visa? She was like, I just took the picture of me and George Bush. They gave me my visa right away. <laughs> <laughs> so we're texting on the phone. I was driving up here tonight, so she should be arriving on May 21st. I've got to get her a picture with Obama now. <laughs> yes? What, if anything, surprises you about President Obama? <laughs> he has a different persona outside than he does inside. You know, he's really great when he's on, you know, out in the crowd giving a speech. He's very, you know, he's very charismatic in a very politician 
way, what surprised me is how much the people who work for him are scared of him. And he can be a little mean inside, you know, in meetings and that kind of stuff. He's like, you know, he's, it's beyond the, every president is like, oh, it's the commander in chief, Mr. President, this, Mr. President, that. But he can be, he can be, he doesn't suffer fools very gladly. And he's always, he's read the briefing book, and so he doesn't want you telling him something that he already, you know, he already knows, and he's very, you know, uh, let's get to the point, let's, let's, let's run this meeting, let's do this really quickly. Any other questions? How does he treat the, what's your feeling when he tries? He hates us. <laughs> oh my God, he hates us. But every president hates the press. They think we're jackals. <laughs> they don't, they don't, I mean, but yeah, that's, yeah. but that's good. You don't want them to like you. What about his press secretary? There was a big article in the New York Times about a week ago about him and his attitude. That was in the Washington Post. That article oh, wasn't in the New York Times. Well, um. well, well, you didn't write it yet. But what's your opinion about uh, I don't think Gibbs likes reporters much either, but he's very, I mean, he's, he's definitely, he can, he can talk. Robert Gibbs is capable of great stretches of talking without ever saying anything, and that's quite a gift. He is able to, it's, this, this is his ability to filibuster, um, where, you know, he's going on and on, and if you look at what he, if you look at what he says, he hasn't answered your question, and he not only hasn't answered your question, he's talked for like 20 minutes and has not said anything. And that's a gift. And that's the gift of, you know, like the best press secretaries, I think. Because a lot of times they go into this stuff and they very much just want to get out of it without, first do no harm, without, you know, taking the policy any further than they want to take it. And so I think that uh, gives probably his greatest gift. I see my time is up. Well, I think we're going to give you a rest Okay, here. thank you. And the bookstore has come and has copies of your book, if you're willing to sign for, sure. for anyone that wants to buy it. And then we also have a reception in the corner. Um, and so please join me in thanking Lynn. Thank you.